or wander around so tonight we'll start with some wandering um thank you all for for being here um and, and linda for having me uh i can talk science and space telescopes so i'm blue in the face so um but you should feel free to interrupt me and ask questions i like interactive talks so um please just feel free to put your hand up and we're, i'm happy to to answer questions as we go um so let's get rid of all this stuff okay there we go so this is the largest image ever produced by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's 1.6 gigapixels or 1.6 billion pixels. And if you wanted to display it in full definition, it would take 600 high definition televisions. It's gigantic. And you'll notice by all these little squares and this kind of weird shape to it, we had to piece it together one little bit at a time. It did not just come like this. In fact, there's 400 individual little squares we had to stitch together to make this image. It was a lot of work. Um, and it took 800 hours of Hubble time to actually make this. So it um, you know, took about four or five years of our lives and it's still going on. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about some of the things we've learned from this and how we put this together. But in order to understand how we got to the largest Hubble ever, you know, image ever, I wanna talk about the history of, of Hubble. Um, so this is, uh, this is Hubble. Uh, many of you may recognize this. Um, Today is April 17th. Hubble was launched on April 24th, 1990. So we're almost to a birthday, uh, the 29th birthday of Hubble. Uh, it's orbiting about 600 kilometers above the Earth. That's 400 miles. Uh, the pro to that is that it's easy to fix because it was designed to be fixed. The cons are, of course, you need to fix it. Um, the other con is that the Earth gets in the way some of the time, so you can't point the telescope at the Earth. Uh, there's some drag from the atmosphere, and so it comes and spirals back in, so you have to do a lot of maintenance. So this is a pro and a con, um, and it required a lot of complicated planning, of course, to get it into orbit, and so I'm gonna talk about some of that today. But before we get into those details, uh, this really, this idea of launching something into space, if you just were to think about that, say 50 years ago, it's a little bit crazy, 60 years ago. Um, but that's exactly how this started. Um, it started with this, this paper. This paper, The Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory by a professor named Lyman Spitzer, Jr., who uh, was a professor at Princeton. And he wrote this in 1946, and it was this idea that if we could put something, a telescope, outside of the atmosphere of the Earth, it would enable a whole new range of science that just wasn't possible. I mean, Talk about forward thinking, right? I mean, this was a long time ago, and this was just, just a concept, a seed of an idea. Um, and so this is really you know, the kind of visionary stuff that legends are made of in Spitzer, of course, is a legend in the astronomical community. So um, you know, to summarize a, a interesting paper, there were really two main scientific benefits to why you would ever want to put the telescope above the Earth's atmosphere. The first is that you can observe at wavelengths that otherwise are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. So we don't receive heavy UV radiation, which is a good thing because we don't have sunburns all the time, and skin cancer. Um, so, so you can observe in the UV or the infrared. I mean, we only really see a very narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, on Earth, especially uh, in, compared to ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. The second reason is that you can get better angular resolution than is possible from the ground. And what this really means is that you can just separate things uh, more cleanly. Uh, and this has to do with the Earth's atmosphere interfering with our observations primarily. So the idea is this. Uh, if you have this star that you're trying to observe with your telescope on Earth, this turbulence in the atmosphere, kind of the random motions of particles that are just going around, tend to cause the light to zig and zag. And what you see, you know, if you just did this for one line of sight, you have this little, you know, this single star. But this turbul most turbulence moves around, and what ends up happening is your star gets smeared out. And so if you have a bunch of stars next to each other, they'll get smeared into a fuzzy blob, and you can't actually tell that it was a single star. And this effect in astronomy we call seeing. And it turns out that modulus and very sophisticated uh, instrument building, if you can, just, you can build arbitrarily large telescopes on Earth, and you still can't get around this effect. And so one of the solutions was, let's put a telescope above the Earth's atmosphere. There's no turbulence from the Earth's atmosphere. And you can then make out very fine details. 
And so this is one of the most compelling arguments for putting something into space, is that you can really study things that are otherwise very close together. So again, this is what, what Lyman Spitzer pitched in uh, 1946. It wasn't called the Hubble Space Telescope at the time. It went through several name, name changes as, uh, as various people took on the, the mantle of making it happen. Um, so 1946, you have to fast forward about three decades. Uh, and in 1977, Congress finally funded Hubble. Um, so this was, a, this was a milestone moment. Uh, the estimated cost for launch of Hubble in 1977 was about $300 million. That's about a billion dollars in today's currency. Um, Congress allocated $38 million for it and said, eh, let's, let's experiment and see what happens. Uh, and with the you know, idea that they were going to get there. So, um, you know, Congress, when they fund something, it's, you know, Expediency and efficiency come right afterwards. So Hubble, as you know, launched very shortly after. No, not really. <laughs> right. okay. This is the timeline of Hubble's launch dates. So this is the you know, calendar year, and this is how many months to launch. And so if you start at point one, this is where funding would began. And the idea was that it was supposed to launch about 80 months later, so that puts it kind of at mid-1983. And so, okay, what happens? They go, and all of a sudden, there's an event in 1980. This is the shuttle, so the shuttle that would have to carry it up into space. Well, that had some difficulties, and that got delayed, so that pushed back the, the launch date a little bit. So this is point two here, and so now the projected launch date was 1985. And you can see this sawtooth pattern just continues, and there's all sorts of challenges and delays. Um, perhaps the most notable is number five, which was the explosion of Challenger in 1986. Uh, this was obviously catastrophic uh, for a number of reasons, but it also delayed the, the launch of Hubble. Uh, and as you can see, finally we converge and, and have launched in, in 1990. The key takeaway here is that complicated projects take time and they never follow a straight path. This is true of every big thing we've tried to do in astronomy ever. And this will be a recurring theme when I talk about James Webb a little bit later. But, but even for Hubble, this is very complicated. And also just to note, at launch in 1990, the actual cost of Hubble in today's dollars was $4 billion. So it went up from $1 to $4 billion just from those delays. And the cost to date to use and maintain Hubble uh, cumulative is about $10 billion. So not cheap, but I would argue it's a very good return on, on investment. OK. so. Uh, what does it look like? This is Hubble pre-launch in 1990. So this gives you some sense of scale. Here's a person in the clean room, and this is this is Hubble. It's about the size of a school bus. I think it weighs something like 15 tons or something. It's you know, not light. Um, and so this is, you can just get a sense of scale. We're putting something very big into space. Um, this is the primary mirror. It's two and a half meters, or just over eight feet tall. See, nice reflection of the scientists working on it. Um, of course, the mirror is also a reoccurring theme in Hubble. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can just get a sense of the size of what was launched into space. Of course, by today's standards, two and a half meters is not a particularly large professional telescope. We can find two and a half meters that aren't being used all over the place uh, on the ground. But in space, actually, it's still quite cutting edge. So fast forward to April 10th, 1990. This is a New York Times article, uh, an interview with Lyman Spitzer, um, two weeks before Hubble is scheduled to launch. And uh, so this is all the story of how he had this idea and basically had been the, the strong lobbyist, advocate, scientist, everything to make this, this happen over the past, well, 50 years or so, right? So this is his entire career was launching Hubble, basically. What I wanted to highlight is this, which you may or may not be able to read, so I'll read it to you. And it says, in 1946, Lyman Spitzer identified four questions that he thought a space telescope could answer. And this is how he listed them. One, the extent of the universe. Two, the structure of galaxies. Three, the structure of globular clusters. And four, the nature of other planets. So he is such a visionary that these are still questions we're trying to answer today. We've gotten made a lot of progress, but I would argue that this is still the cutting edge of astronomy today. So just incredible that someone had this kind of foresight and had ideas how we can solve them uh, and, and, and make progress. So this is two weeks before Hubble launches. This is a picture of Hubble going up into space on shuttle discovery. 
April 24th, 1990. I mean, this image to me is just fantastic that we can just, the, the sheer power of the rockets is just amazing that it takes to launch. In the space, unfortunately, we don't have the shuttle program anymore, but this is just iconic to me. Um, so the idea was you launch Hubble in April, it takes a couple months to get it into orbit and do some commissioning, and then we're good to go, and we have data and everything which is good. And so the first headline to come out from Hubble was this on the cover of this week. Uh-oh. Uh, you know, I guess it's good that Germany had a unified currency, but the big, <laughs> the big issue, of course, uh, is that Hubble, the first thing it gets is, here's this thing you've been working on for 20 years, and it doesn't work. Uh, so that's not good for NASA, and, and uh, this is, of course, a big deal. Uh, so, so what's the issue? What's the problem? Here's the problem. If you take an image of a star in space, this is what you should get. It's very point-like. It's a star. We, we can easily identify this. Uh, if you take an image of the same star from the ground, this is what it would look like. Uh, this is that blurring effect I was telling you about. So you can see right here with the visual, just visually what the advantage of going into space is. And this is what Hubble was seeing when it first launched. It is just a mess. And in fact, 85% of the light that it was supposed to observe was being scattered in ways that it couldn't measure. So this is not good. So, okay, why did this happen? I mean, obviously this is a problem. Why did this happen? Well, this has to do with something in optics we've known since the time of Newton, and it's called spherical aberration. And the idea is this. If you build a mirror that's spherical, it can't focus light into a single point. And so you get these, these are called focal points. You get focal points that don't all align, and, this is, and then you get a blurry image, basically. And what you really want is a parabolic mirror, because that actually focuses light to the same point, and then it becomes a sharp, clear image. So what happened, well, what happened was the people who ground the mirror for Hubble, so this, there's a little bit of politics behind this. The original proposal for Hubble called for two mirrors to be manufactured to check spec on each other. But the government said, no, no, that's too expensive. Let's just do one. So they did one. There was no check on it. And at like the fourth decimal place and you know, the mirror curvature term or whatever, they got it wrong. And so they had a spherical mirror instead of a parabolic mirror. So in astronomy, things so like factors of three are typically pretty good, but this is like a fourth decimal place issue, so this is a very engineering thing. Yes? Why wasn't the mirror tested with a conventional test, like all the amateur astronomers? Yeah, it's a good question that I actually haven't been able to find the answer to, and I'm sure it's buried in some report somewhere. Uh, they did some testing. Um, it turns out that spherical aberration, so the test you would, would do initially would be, I'm gonna image a very small like point source of light, and it turns out that's less affected by spherical aberration, so it's possible that it's still past the spec. But when you do a galaxy like this, I mean, this is an actual Hubble image from before the, that was corrected. You can't, it's hard to check for that on the ground. I don't, I'm not saying that that's what, what happened, but, but it was something like maybe a past spec for some certain thing, and they really didn't think about all the possibilities. How did they succeed with a military telescope that was made just before the Hubble that was the same size or maybe even bigger? Um, I think the military doesn't like to share their technology with NASA. <laughs> <laughs> we still find this true today. One of the telescopes that's being considered for launch in 2025 is an old military telescope from like 10 years ago, but it would be new technology for NASA. So something's going on. You know, there's just not a lot of crosstalk, I think. Okay. For better or worse, I don't know. Can I add a little to this? Yes, please. Um, I don't know if it's true, but I remember at the time, the story came out that in the manufacturer, somebody had left, like, you know, I don't know, a piece of wire or something. There was some mechanical mistake. And I also recall, again, I don't know if this is true, that the response to why they didn't test it was, well, their process was so precise, they didn't need to. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if any of those are true, but those were rumors circulating at the time. 
Um, based on, on things that have happened with James Webb, I think that could absolutely be true. Uh, okay. and, well, I'll, I'll tell you some of the challenges that they faced as well, and I think they're along those lines. It's hard to corroborate these things, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Why did they name it Hubble? Why did they name it Hubble? They named it Hubble after Edwin Hubble, who was the person that discovered the expansion of the universe. And so they t typically name space telescopes or big telescopes after famous scientists. And so this was in honor of his work about 70 years in, uh, in the past. And so uh, like Lyman Spitzer had a telescope named after him called the Spitzer Space Telescope. So the solution, the solution to the spherical aberration was, well, okay, we could try to put another mirror up there, but those are heavy and big, and how do you do that? So instead, they gave Hubble glasses. Um, more like contact lenses, but the glasses actually. I don't know what's better. Um, so they gave Hubble glasses, and I'm not kidding. Like, this is what they did. Um, they, they flew up there, and they repaired the optics by basically putting um, some corrective lenses on. So this is, uh, this is the astronauts in 1993 training to go put the corrective lens on Hubble. So they're in this big water tank um, at NASA HQ or something like this. And you have all your you know, support scuba divers down there. And here are the astronauts practicing the repair. Right When you go into space, you get one shot at this. At least in the pool, you get many shots. Um, and so they had to do a lot of practice. Um, turns out they're pretty good at it. Uh, they went up and did it in one shot. Uh, this is um, Repair service, service Mission 1, is what they called it in December 1993, and this is them. This is an astronaut getting ready to actually install the corrective lens next to Hubble. This is the actual repair. I mean, I mean this looks like a staged photo, but this is them in the process of doing the repair. Uh, it's pretty cool because you know, they had to design all these special tools to go up and actually do this. They had to be just the right weight and they're just opening that particular bolt. So they have their very special toolkit it's for one purpose, and that was fixing things on Hubble. The warranty, they say, is three years. <laughs> they don't warranty labor. Um, so as I said earlier, Hubble is designed to be serviced. This was one of the things, put it in the geosynchronous orbit a few hundred miles above Earth and we can go fix it. So it's designed to be serviced every few years, which means it wasn't designed to last very long without being serviced, which uh, I will talk a little bit more about later. So uh, the idea was that you know they thought, OK, fine, five years, totally reasonable. We have the shuttle program, invest a lot of money in. You know, uh, If it lasts more than five years without servicing mission, that would be amazing. Uh, just to show you, you know, this is before and after, so this is without glasses, this is with glasses, and you can just see it's night and day, right? Just totally different and amazing. Um, and so, so this solved it. I mean, there were mistakes made, but also we have some really amazing people that figured out how to fix it without having to haul a huge mirror up into space and try to replace it. Yeah? Why does it say M100 Galactic Nucleus? Um, so M100 is the galaxy. And the idea is they wanted to resolve the middle of the galaxy, which is called the nucleus. Well, they're trying to make the middle of the galaxy especially look better. Exactly. They're focusing on the ends. Well, they're focusing on the whole thing. The question at that time was, how big is the nucleus of a galaxy? And here, you can't tell how big it is, but here you actually can. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. So this correction also allowed Hubble to take some fairly iconic pictures, things that you may be familiar with, like the Eagle Nebula. So this is where stars are forming actively. So you have stars and, and jets of energy from newly forming stars coming out of this molecular material in space. Uh, I think this is one of the most iconic Hubble photos you may have seen. Um, anyhow, this is now 1994, and it's working. And that's great, because you know, otherwise it really would be a blunder if they couldn't fix the corrective lenses. And they did, which is which is really a testament to, to what we can do in terms of engineering. So uh, let's put this into the broader timeline context. This was Hubble's launch. And this is a history of the service missions. So this is the number of times they sent astronauts up in the shuttle to fix things. So here, service mission one in 1993, CoStar is the corrective lens, the glasses they put on. They also put on a new camera. They fix these things called gyros, so these spinning things up there that measure its stability. 
So these also have its moving parts, and as you know, moving parts don't typically last as long as other things, so we had to keep fixing those. Uh, they went up again in 1997, so four years between servicing missions. Uh, they made some, mod you know, just added some new instruments, fixed the fine guidance sensor. This is what finds stuff on the sky and helps it point very um, accurately. Another servicing mission in 99 and 2002. These are just largely fixing, um, they're fixing, uh, you know, problems because it has to be updated. The radiation from space degrades the electronics and things like this. They added uh, a couple new cameras, the advanced camera for surveys. Um, and then in 2002, like, I think 2003, there was another shuttle issue. Uh, and so then they said maybe there will be no more servicing missions. This was 2003 when Hubble was just 13 years old. Um, just one second. And then um, in 2009, they finally said, okay, we're going to do another servicing mission. They replaced the batteries, installed new gyros and stuff, and that was it. The shuttle program has been ended essentially since then, and we have not been able to fix it. So now it's 10 years later, and actually it's amazing that Hubble is still operating basically exactly as expected. I mean, it's degrading, but it's still doing pretty well. Yes? Um, well, I was wondering what CoStar is and what Nikos is. Um, so CoStar is the like glasses that they put on Hubble. Oh, it's the glasses. Yep. So what's the Nikos? So it's called yeah, it's pronounced Nikos, and it's an infrared camera. Uh, it's oh. a, a very old infrared camera they installed. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Hubble probably needs that. Yeah, it turns out that, that I'll talk about some of the the infrared observations that Hubble's taken. Yeah. Um, so this is another iconic picture from Hubble. This was taken in 1995. And the idea here was in 1995, we had this scientific conundrum. In the Milky Way, we knew that there were some globular clusters that were really, really old. So globular clusters are collections of stars that are bound together by gravity. And we knew from stellar evolution theory that they were really old. But in 1995, we also had never seen a galaxy as old as a globular cluster. That is, if you look out into the distant universe, you should see galaxies that are old. But we didn't, we didn't know that they actually existed at that time. We'd never seen one. And so the director of space telescope said, you know, OK, Hubble is designed to look at things that are really faint. So let's go stare at a blank patch of sky. And this is the thing you would never propose to do unless you're the director and you can just tell them to do it. Because people would say, you're crazy. You don't go stare at a blank patch of sky. But he said, okay, we're going to go stare at one patch of sky for 500 hours, and let's see what we get. And so what you see here is uh, 1,500 galaxies at different distances from us. And when you get far enough away, distance is like a proxy for age. The further away you are, the older you are. And these are 1,500 galaxies that go all the way back until the very early, earliest times in the universe. And this is amazing. This is something that we only hypothesized existed at the time, and it helped resolve some tensions we had between what we knew about locally and what we didn't know existed in the distant universe. This is arguably one of the most important observations ever made, and it was made only because we had a telescope in space. This is 1995. Yes? Is it correct to think that this exists in any direction you would go, you would see this number of galaxies? Yes, that's right. We don't think there's anything special about this patch of sky. That's right. Uh, any direction you point, you see something like this. Uh, and in fact, we've, we've, we've repeated this experiment in other directions and basically have confirmed this. Um, so 10 years later, they said, you know, we put a new camera on, it's even more sensitive, and has an even bigger field of view than what we had in 1995, so we're going to repeat the experiment. So they went and got the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Not really creatively named, but you get the point. Um, so here, this is the you know, same idea. We're going to stare at the same spot in the sky for 500 hours, and now they get 10,000 galaxies. So it's really just quite incredible. Um, and so now we actually know that there are galaxies just a few hundred million years. So the you know, universe is 13.8 billion years old. We're finding galaxies that are just a few hundred million years old you know, after the Big Bang. So they're very, very young. We're able to see this thanks uh, in part to Hubble. So these are just. Yeah. Is this the same spot in the sky? Um, so this is the same spot, and they've done several. They've done multiple deep fields now uh, to build up the statistics and, and verify this. But yeah, so they said let's let's do the same thing. I mean, I think it's like the orientation or whatever, slightly different, but yeah, same same general area. 
So again, 10,000 galaxies, and this is just like you know some tiny, if you held a, a pin at arm's length, that's the size of the Hubble field of view, just, just in some tiny little patch. And we now think, thanks to Hubble, there's something like two trillion galaxies in the universe, just some incredible number. What's also incredible is that each galaxy on here has its own story. And so the idea is that here they appear as just these little smudges, um, but you know we live in a galaxy. It had a story. Its you know ancestor was around sometime in the early universe. And so you know one of the goals of what we do locally is try to unravel what that story is. So uh, switching to something much closer, this is an artist's conception of the galaxy we live in, Milky Way. And you can think of any of those galaxies in the ultra deep field as something like the Milky Way at some point in time. Uh, so we live, this is our solar system, so we kind of live in what I like to call the suburb of the galaxy. About two thirds of the way down, it's kind of a typical place, nothing really exciting is happening, but it's pretty nice anyway. Um, our galaxy is about 100 billion stars, it's about 100,000 light years across. Of course, we can't actually see most of it, right, we're inside of it. It would be like asking you from inside the museum to tell us what the geography of the Bay Area was. You can get some glances out the window here and there, but you really can't see most of it and you can't put distances and other things into it. So it turns out it's, you know, we can study it in incredible detail, but only in small patches, and so we have to do uh, something else. And so this, this idea that every galaxy has its own story, that we don't really understand, I mean, we know it's complicated, but we don't know what all the stories are, and that we can't really see most of our own galaxy because we live inside it motivated the panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury Survey, the FAT survey, which I'm going to talk about, because Andromeda is the next closest galaxy, and because it's just not, we're not inside of it, we can actually see basically the whole galaxy. And so, you know, what you want to do is really dissect another galaxy at the level of detail as the Milky Way and be able to see all of it. So that's what motivated the study. Now this, you may or, or may not recognize, is, is M31, as you may have seen in your telescopes, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and I'm going to just show you this movie which zooms in from what we see from the ground to what we have done with Hubble, and you will just see this wonderful transition into, into pretty amazing detail. So we're just going to zoom in, and at some point it'll become very clear when we switched to the whole image. And you can see we just keep zooming and zooming and zooming and zooming in. And every point you're seeing is an individual star in Andromeda. Andromeda is about 3 million light years away. I have probably seen this about 500 times, but I don't get sick of it ever. It's just amazing to me that this is another galaxy. So just to orient you, you know, you can see there are blue stars, it's the blue point stars, some bright red stars, some faint red stars. You can see these dark patches here. That is not us seeing through Andromeda. That's some molecular material that's going to form stars in Andromeda. That's just obscuring light. Uh, it's just an incredible amount of detail you can see. And the only reason you can do it is because of, of Hubble. Um, so as I said, this program called the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury was something that um, we started in 2009 and finished taking observations in about 20, early 2014, late 2013. Um, and we had a lot of work to do because we had to stitch together uh, a lot of little Hubble pointings. Yes? Um, I was wondering how many globular clusters they were able to identify in the M31. Um, I will show you in about 10 slides exactly what we did with the clusters. Yeah. Uh, the answer is a lot. Um, but, but I'll show you a little bit in a little more detail. Um, just for comparison, so this is, a, this is a picture of Andromeda and this little square, this is background cutout. And this upper image is from the ground. And if you zoom in on this little tiny star forming region, you can see these blue blobs here. This is what you get from a four meter class telescope on the ground. And then you can do the same thing, this is the exact same region with Hubble, and you zoom in on the same region, and all these blue blobs become blue individual stars. And this, this is really the power of Hubble as we go from, well, is this five stars or one star into, this is an individual star that we're resolving in another galaxy. Um, and so, you know, this is just this incredible power of putting a two and a half meter telescope just into orbit. This is what allows us to do this. 
Um, so I'm going to just talk about the survey a little bit, and then I'll talk about some of the science. Um, so Hubble, the way they measure time is in orbit. How like one orbit is the time it takes to go around the Earth, and that's how you get the word of time with Hubble. Is you get you know, one orbit is yours to observe something. Uh, so FAT was 828 orbits, which is about 75,000 minutes of observation time, or roughly 50 24-hour days. So this is one of the largest programs Hubble's ever done. The typical program is something like four orbits. So this is gigantic, and it's spread out over about four years. Um, what, what I'm showing here is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum in which we observe things in. So um, humans can see roughly somewhere, these are these funny units called angstroms, uh, which, which we use, we have very funny units of astronomy. Angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Um, we see, as humans see some very narrow range of visible light, which corresponds to what I would call the, the G band here. This is the, the, the filter you put on the telescope. Um, and so, in fact, we had things in the ultraviolet, and we had things in the infrared, things that people just can't see from the ground, uh, or, or humans can't see with their eye, and, and some of these you can't see very well from the ground. And the idea was that if you have all these different filters, you get to tell things, you, know, you get to learn things about all different types of stars from very hot, massive stars to things like our sun. And so this was the idea was to make it panchromatic. Um, now, just to give you a sense of scale, this is another picture of Andromeda uh, taken with a, a different satellite, um, so not, not HST. Uh, this is a picture of the moon to scale. So this just gives you a sense of how big Andromeda is on the sky. And this is the size of one HST field. So um, you want to tile out you know, this large thing that is many moons across. Uh, with something that's you know essentially the size of a postage stamp, so um, it turned out to be a particularly complicated way you had to plan the observations to tie out this large area with this tiny little thing. Like Hubble was not designed to tie out large areas. So uh, when we were proposing to do this, we said, what's the most efficient way to do this and learn stuff about Andromeda? Tiling everything was completely out because they were, we required more time than Hubble has available. So we said, all right, let's just zoom in on a quadrant because we can still learn a lot, and then we define some survey area. That's what's shown in pink here. And this survey area was broken into these things we call bricks. So bricks are the are, are informal terminology for observational units. And if we break down a brick, you get these complicated observing patterns. So this, one little square in a brick, is one Hubble field of view. So a brick is 18. Hubble fields of view, basically, and then you had to do all these bricks, and then you had to stitch them all together. So, lots of work and planning. And it gets even a little more complicated because Hubble has two cameras, and you can operate them simultaneously, and so that makes your observations more efficient. So the way it works like is, is what I'm showing up here. So you get uh, a primary field here, and then at the same time, you have another camera running on Hubble, and so you're getting two different cameras at the same time. And then you do this tiling, this three by three tiling. And then six months later, you go back and you flip the cameras and you do the time to complete the tiling on the other side. And then you repeat that for the entire 23 bricks in the survey. So it took uh, a lot of time and, and planning to get this right. In fact, just the observational file that you, know, you set it up on a computer, it took like three hours to just open on the laptop. It was so big and complicated. <laughs> I have a couple couple questions. Sure. Did, you, did you have any issues with parallax if you're taking images six months apart? Um, the answer is no, because things just don't shift around very much uh, at that at distance least, over that kind of time yeah. at this distance. Yeah. And my other question was, did you learn something by inverting the black and white, the light and dark? Is that you mean flipping the cameras? Uh, uh, no, no, or? no. Just looking, take your bricks out of the picture. Just ah. the, the image of the of the Andromeda galaxy. You're presenting it here where the, th the objects that would produce light that we'd observe are, are dark, you know, the negative, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this is just, this is is just a scaling that I've put up okay. to, to illustrate it. Got it. I will answer the other thing you didn't ask, because we learned actually a lot about Hubble's camera by flipping them over like this. Okay. Um, it turns out so you, get a, you get the same star, but observed at a different point on the camera. And it turns out the measurements are slightly different, depending on where in Hubble's camera you take this. And so we actually got to map out 
a lot of the systematic defects in Hubble's camera this way, which was great for the engineers and terrible for us as scientists. <laughs> yeah. Good question. How long does it take to set up, you know, point the scope and stabilize it yeah. to such precision? Yeah, five minutes. Mm. Wow. No, literally five minutes, yeah. Isn't that incredible? Mm. Yeah. yeah, so there's this thing, when you're planning the observations, you have to account for a thing called guide star acquisition. Mm -hmm. So they use a bright star in the near area to, to use this, what's called a fine guidance sensor, which I mentioned earlier. And that's how they hone in on, on what they want. It takes five minutes of time to do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe a, uh, a supernova has ever been uh, detected in uh, M31. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, it's due. Milky Way is due for one, too. Because uh, it's about one a century in a, in a galaxy like Andromeda. Yeah. And the exposure time for each of those blocks generally generally how hard to say? Yeah, so, so each of these little kind of pointings was a few hundred seconds. And then you would stop, you know, you'd do a couple of exposures at a time. And because this mitigates cosmic rays and other things that might mess with your images. Uh, and that, that's it. And then you, you know, that's that's all you really need. So I think in total, each one's like, I don't know, 1,200 seconds, 1,400 seconds, something like that. Yeah. So yes, we had to race through a lot of area. Turns out Hubble's, you know, incredibly, incredibly sensitive, so you don't really need that much time for, for Andromeda. So anyhow, it took just forever just to get us to design this scheme. I mean, it was very complicated. Um, but anyhow, also, you know, very proud moment when it actually works, you know. So um, what did we get at the end of the day? Well, we got measurements of 117 million stars. So this is the this is a galactic this, this is Andromeda. So we got 117 million stars in that little point right there. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, of course, it's only a small fraction of the total number of stars in the galaxy, and the Milky Way has something like a few hundred billion stars. So this is you know, 170 million is a lot, but but there's many stars that were just so faint even Hubble can't detect them. So you should naturally be asking yourself, why did we spend all this time with Hubble to image Andromeda? Was it just to make the pretty picture? <laughs> no, we actually learned we actually learned some science, and so I want to just talk about a few of the science things that we've learned. Um, you know, it took us four years to get the data and figure out how to stitch everything together because no one had done this before. So that was a real technical challenge. But we also got to learn a lot about Andromeda and how galaxies work. So um, from other observations, we know stuff about how Andromeda is forming stars now. So very young, hot, massive stars emit a lot of light in the ultraviolet wavelengths, very short wavelengths. And they also, for, for reasons, you know, they have dust around them, interstellar dust, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, they also emit things in the infrared that keep things up. And so if you observe Andromeda in, you know, this, is, this is not very high resolution, but, but in the ultraviolet and the infrared wavelengths, you learn something about how many stars and are forming now and what they're doing, and that's what this is a picture of. And so, okay, this is nice, but we can also, with Hubble, say something about what was happening in Andromeda in the past, something that's not possible from these types of images. And so to understand this a little bit more, I just want to talk about very basic stellar evolution. So um, this is something called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, and, and this is, if you know a star's luminosity, so it's like, a star is like a light bulb, right? Your light bulb is like 100 watts, that's its luminosity. And you can measure its, its temperature. Your light bulbs also have a temperature. Right? Especially if you buy these LEDs and they say, okay, what kind of temperature do you want? You know, like a cool 2700 Kelvin or something, which doesn't mean much to a lot of people, but those cooler, cooler temperatures are, are more like the light bulbs we're used to. You can put the stars on the so called Hertz Prong Russell diagram. So our sun is right about here. And um, the idea is that these stars are undergoing nuclear reactions inside them, so they're taking hydrogen and converting them into helium in their cores, which is kind of an amazing thing in and of itself. So all these stars on the main sequence are doing this. And it turns out that the more massive you are, the bigger the star you are, the faster you go through these nuclear reactions and the faster you die, basically. So live fast, die young kind of thing. And so if you were to make a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, like Hubble can observe individual stars and measure temperatures and luminosities of different regions in a galaxy, 
you can tell where the young ones are and the older ones are, etc. Things that you can't do without resolving individual stars. So that's the basic idea for using stellar evolution theory and how well you can measure individual stars. So, much more visually, if you look at two regions in Andromeda, so this is a the fat image of, of Andromeda, you can just see that they're very different, right? This region has a lot of blue stars, a lot of young activity, there's no blue stars, no, no, no hot stars in it. And so you can, without me doing any sort of calculations or whatever, you can say, oh, there's young blue stars here, something must have happened recently, no young blue stars here, something happened in the past, but not recently. And that's the idea when you resolve individual stars. And so you can get a little more quantitative than this and actually make maps of star formation in the past by resolving individual stars. So uh, this is where the stars are forming now based on, on other observations. And then you can overlay what Hubble taught us. And this is where stars were forming in Andromeda half a billion years ago. And this is all because we can do stars as essentially cosmic clocks and tell you what was going on when the dinosaurs were alive. It's pretty cool. And the thing that's really cool, I'm just going to flip back and forth. You can see, you know, Andromeda has this really prominent ring structure, which we don't really understand why. We have ideas, we don't really understand this. And if you go back half a billion years, the ring structure is still there. And this is really bizarre. So we think that, you know, contemporary theories are that the ring structure is kind of created like a vortex, like if you watch water go down your drain, there's some, some force that creates this ring structure and you know it dissipates after a while. Uh, in a galaxy, they're supposed to dissipate really quickly. They're not supposed to last half a billion years. But yet in Andromeda, we see this structure persist. We don't understand this unless there's some mechanism that keeps this, this structure alive that we don't know about. So this is already something we don't really understand that has been kind of revolutionary from the, from, from, from the fat survey. It's been around a long time. We just don't do this. So this is already kind of cool because this is something that we don't see in the Milky Way and this is the next closest galaxy to us. So it's just telling us already galaxies have a very, very diverse story of lives. Yes? What is the ultimate question you're trying to answer mm -hmm. by knowing a solar revolution? You can help Andromeda, for example, well, or... That's what you're measuring now, but you're saying we know yeah. the past, we know where we are now. Yep. What's the ultimate why? Um, so, remember earlier when I showed you this Hubble Ultra Deep Field, there were like 10,000 galaxies in there. I don't know if you, you saw this very early. This is what Hubble you know, was famous for a decade ago. There were all these galaxies. We don't know how old they are. We don't know when in the universe they started to form. We need galaxies to form stars. You need stars to form planets. We don't know what that timeline is. We have theories, but we have to actually go out and test them. And the only place you can really test this directly are when you can actually measure individual stellar ages and see how old and how things actually work. Because the distant galaxies will always be smudges to us. Yeah, it's putting together the whole cosmic timeline of like when did things happen and how did it lead to us. Yeah, exactly. You're looking at this to get a bigger perspective. Exactly, that's right. And so, you know, it's more than just stars in Andromeda. We have all sorts of other things, star forming regions, dust, globular clusters, etc. So here's another picture with some stuff labeled. So this is a star forming region. Things are just, you know, it's just starting to form now. We have dust lanes. So there's stuff called interstellar dust. It's a little bit different than the dust you find at home. It's more like that, you know, when you have barbecue and there's a black crud on, on the meat or whatever, that's what interstellar dust is actually like. <laughs> Um, there's globular clusters, some of us here about globular clusters. There's a few that we saw uh, in, in the BAT survey. Uh, globular clusters are these ancient star clusters from the remnants of a very early universe. Um, we have some young star clusters, you can see. So there's just a whole diversity of stuff. Now, um, one of the things that we set out to do with BAT initially was to find all the clusters in the galaxy. And we said, you know, we have a lot of experienced people on the team. We're just going to look through all the images by eye and find them. It did not work so well. Um, it took us like many months just to get through, you know, a quarter or a tenth of the survey. And we said, this is not going to work. There's just too much data, there's too many clusters. Not obvious how we're going to scale this up. So 
we ended up pairing up with a citizen science team, this platform called Zooniverse, where they have these nice web platforms where people from all over the globe can go and help solve science problems uh, online. They just need to like, lend their, their eyes and their decision-making capabilities. So we said, we're going to launch something called the Andromeda Project. And the idea was to make a web platform for people to come and help us identify interesting things by eye in the survey that we would just never get to, or we couldn't write algorithms to actually do this for us because the problem is just too hard. And so this is an example of if you went to the Andromeda Project website, what you would see, you would see some image, some cutout of some small region from the FAT survey, and um, we would do a little tutorial where we'd say, here's what a star cluster looks like, this is what an artifact looks like, and other things we were interested in, and then you, know, you would select, what are, what are you seeing there? And, and then people would, would do this, and we were hoping that instead of taking many years of our team individually doing this, you know, maybe take a few months or something like that. Well, it turned out to be incredibly popular, and it was done in 25 days. The entire <laughs> survey. We had, we had 1.8 million classifications. That means people looked at things and, and clicked on something 1.8 million times. It's incredible. I mean, we had no idea. We really didn't think it was going to happen this fast. We had 30,000 people from around the world do this. You can see every continent is represented. Um, just incredible. We had one person that went through the entire survey in 24 hours. And we were like, this is, this is just, you know, they shouldn't be doing it. It's probably not healthy. But, <laughs> or, or, you know, probably they're just clicking on random things. But it actually turns out they were pretty good because we would insert artificial or fake clusters in there to check to make sure people were getting them. And this person was actually quite good. So. Uh, they were from Kansas. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, just you know, incredible the level of enthusiasm and, and participation. People were really excited about this. These are some comments from the message board. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, people, we were just blown away by how excited and, and just successful people were. It's just incredible. Um, this is a little movie that's highlighting a compilation of how people identify things. So everywhere you see a white circle, someone would click and indicate the size of a cluster. And everywhere you see a green circle, someone would say, no, no, I think that's actually an artifact or something going on in the image. And so then we said, well, everywhere where people click a lot, that's probably a cluster. And then, you know, we put these artificial clusters in there, too, to test people, you know, make sure that they were doing okay. And so this is just, these are different fields that people did. You can see in general, people, people agree. Um, but not always, not always. Um, but anyhow, it's pretty incredible that we got so many people, and on average, 80 people looked at each image. So just, just incredible. Um, so what did we find from this? Well, we've created the largest ever catalog of star clusters. 2,700 star clusters, and each blue dot on this fat image is a star cluster that we found, in, or I shouldn't say we, citizen scientists found in Andromeda. So just pretty incredible. Another thing we asked them to find were distant galaxies in the background, which is interesting for other scientific reasons. So there's 2,200 background galaxies that they identified. So pretty incredible there too. So you know, this is just to, to me illustrated just the power of citizen scientists. I mean, we tried to write algorithms to do this, and it just the computer just did not do well at this. But people did really well at this. So we have a long way to go with uh, with artificial intelligence. I think. Were those globular clusters? No, they're not, in fact. Most of them are not globular clusters. Uh, that's a good segue to the next slide, which is showing how many clusters we found um, versus how bright they were. So the brighter clusters are over here, and so the black histogram, this is what fat recovered, and, and red was what we already knew about. And so globular clusters are generally pretty bright, so they live kind of in this area. And so I guess one is that we recovered all known globular clusters, so that's a good sanity check. Um, but where we really excelled were in faint things, things that you just couldn't tell were clusters from the ground because they were just blurred out or the, the, the ground-based ground observations weren't sensitive enough. And so the bulk of this was finding really faint things that you know, we're now able to study these what we call less luminous or lower mass clusters that we just haven't had observations of before. Turns out that you can get 
globular clusters, which are really big, but you can also get these puny clusters that are not much bigger than, than a couple hundred times the mass of the sun. So it, it opened up a whole new avenue of the cluster studies. Um, some images of clusters. So if you take this bad image and zoom in on the, the white box, this is what you would get. So these blue regions are star forming regions. And pick some clusters out with boxes around them, and you can zoom in even more. And these are actual true color, well, false color images, but almost true color images of, of star clusters uh, in M31. And so you can just see you're seeing all the individual stars or many individual stars in star clusters in M31, which is pretty incredible. The big science result from this, one of the things we're interested in is does Andromeda have the same type of stars that the Milky Way has? And what I mean is, are there the same number of solar mass stars there? Sun-like stars or more massive stars or anything like this? Are there variations? And one thing we found was that M31 Andromeda has 25% fewer massive stars than our own galaxy. We don't know why, but, but there are fewer massive stars. And massive stars are what create the metals that make us up and stuff. And so it has effects on, on the history of the galaxy and this is our again our next closest galaxy, and there's questions of if, you know does every galaxy have a different number of, of stars like this, and that makes understanding galaxy evolution a little more complicated. Yeah. Is that big red star the corner or three point three a star? This one. Star cluster. Is that a red star cluster or is it a giant red star? It's neither. Um, this actually is a star from our own Milky Way that happened to be in the way. <laughs> so it's a nuisance. So, so it was just a small star yes. that was in the way of the <laughs> Exactly. That's, that's cool. That's a little annoying. It's <laughs> <laughs> not what you're looking for. Yeah. No, it's pretty cool. It, it is cool. Um, it also is annoying because it tends to saturate the detector. And so when you plan your observations, you have to avoid the bright foreground stars in the Milky Way. It really screw screw with your observations. Um, one of the other things we learned about M31 was its dust. Now, most astronomers consider dust to be a nuisance because we care about the stars and other things, and there's this dust gunk, basically, that's made during star formation that gets in the way. But, you know, galaxies are filled with this stuff. I mean, our galaxies, tons of it. Um, and so, just by accident, this was not something we set out to do, we figured out a clever way to actually map out where all the dust is in M31. Um, and so the idea is this. This is, this is a, an observer's Hertzsprung-Russell diagram where you plot the temperature and the luminosity of a star. And it turns out if you go into the infrared, so much redder wavelengths that humans can see, these stars, these are red giant stars that we observed in Andromeda, they all basically have the same temperature. So they're excellent thermometers. And then when we looked at parts of Andromeda, we'd see this nice narrow sequence. Same temperature stars, different luminosities. But other parts, you'd see one little sequence, which you can barely see, and another one that's at a slightly different temperature. I said, well, what's going on here? Like, we know that these have a certain temperature. So we thought, long and hard, how do you figure this out? And the only way you can explain it is that there's intervening dust that are actually making these appear cooler than they actually are. OK, that's pretty neat. And so it turns out that you can go to really small regions of M31, make these kind of plots, these kind of diagrams, and it tells you about how much dust is in the way. So we did this. We divided up a whole survey into these tiny little boxes. We said how much dust is in the way in each box. And you can make these maps of how much dust there is in Andromeda. So that's what this is showing. These yellow regions are where there's a lot of dust. And these darker regions are where there's very little dust. And this matters because if you want to get at and understand the stars, I mean, I'm a star person, so I care about the stars. Some people really care about the dust, and they think stars are nuisances. But if you really want to get at the stars, you have to understand how much dust is in the way. Dust is really complicated stuff. Um, and so this is actually one of the highest resolution maps of dust we ever have in a galaxy. And the thing you should take away from this is that it's a train wreck. There's no, I mean, there's some rhyme and reason it kind of traces the ring, but there's this big loop here. It varies over really small scales. The, the amplitude changes a lot, and every galaxy has it. So dust is not, it's this really, really complicated thing. 
Uh, and it's maps like this that help us actually understand it. In fact, the leading models of dust and galaxies mispredicted what this map should look like. And so we're actually able to make progress almost immediately on understanding dust once we make this map. And this is totally serendipitous, something we didn't plan on doing. So this is you know, the power of just serendipitous discovery. Um, just going back to, the, you know, to circle back a little bit, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, 10,000 galaxies in here. Each has a story like Andromeda, but we know that they're not the same. If they were the same, all the galaxies would look the same. And so the question is, well, how much variation is there from story to story? Because this has implications for when a galaxy can form its stars, when it can form its planets, if they have life, when life arises, etc. And so this is kind of the idea is we need to be able to study things locally because you can never do this type of thing in these, these more distant galaxies. These tell us about the early universe, but not the local detail we can do locally. So for science, one thing you should take away, that galaxies are complicated. They're kind of train wrecky. I mean, just, there's a lot of physics going on simultaneously. Star formation moves all over the place in ways we don't really understand yet. We don't quite understand if galaxies all have the same types of stars. We don't quite understand dust, all of them we know it's messy and that we didn't really understand it very well before. So galaxies are everywhere, they're super important, and they're complicated. So, um, you know, this is just some of the things we learned, we learned from fact. The question is, what's next? I mean, we imaged Andromeda, that's the next closest big galaxy. What can we do to further our understanding of galaxies and stars? So, um, some of you may know the Triangulum Galaxy. It's also in the direction of Andromeda. It's a small companion. Uh, you can't actually see in this picture. This is the galactic plane of the Milky Way. This is, this is M31, where my laser pointer is. And M31 is a much smaller companion next to Andromeda. Um, when we originally did the FAT proposal, the T in FAT stood for Triangulum, not Treasury. But we didn't get all the time that the, the science panel said, no, no, just stick with Andromeda for now. But recently we went back and got the rest of the time and looked at the Triangulum Galaxy. So this movie is going to zoom in and show you our basically hot off the presses imaging of the Triangulum Galaxy. So we're going to zoom way in. And you can start to see it. It's like right there. So it's much fainter than Andromeda. I'm going to zoom in. That's a good question. I'm going to keep going. Oh my gosh. Just keep going. What? And keep going. And keep going. And keep going. And this. Uh, is our HST imaging, Hubble imaging of the triangular, which we just completed in January. This is its center region or its nucleus, and these are all individual stars in the triangular, and these are these annoying dust lanes we have to figure out. We have already done some science with this. We did a citizen science launch on finding clusters in the triangulum. So here's 1,300 clusters that citizen scientists identified in the triangulum, also known as M33. Uh, we used these are these. Black squares off to the side are some older Hubble pointings. Uh, this continuous region is what we observed uh, with about 100 hours of Hubble time. So already science is underway. Uh, so this is, this is, we're starting to reach the limits of what Hubble can do, because remember, it's only two and a half meters. I mean, it's amazing that two and a half meters now is not really cutting edge for a telescope. And so we're already starting to plan for what's next. What's next to the James Webb Space Telescope? This is the James Webb in its chamber. Uh, it's missing one mirror, but you can see each of these are beryllium mirrors that are coated with gold. Um, James Webb is six and a half meters and observes at infrared wavelengths. So Hubble is primarily optical, James Webb is infrared. Uh, and it's so big, it doesn't actually fit in anything that we have to launch into space. So it has to fold up, be launched into space, and then unfold itself. Um, it's just pretty incredible. And Hubble is the size of a bus, and, and James Webb is the size of a tennis court. So, just to give you some comparison, 
this distribution would at the bottom. This is just the relative size of the mirrors. So this is like a person for scale, and Hubble's pretty big. And then this is the James Webb Space Telescope, so six and a half meters uh, in diameter. And again, it's 18 segmented pieces that all have to unfold, basically. So it's pretty incredible. And then you can see the relative sizes of the telescopes and whole apertures up here. So again, quite incredible. What's also amazing, this is an engineering thing, is that Webb, despite being much larger, weighs half as much as Hubble. Like that's how much engineering has come along in the last few decades, right? They can just build this thing and it weighs half as much. Yeah. What about Spitzer? So Spitzer is this tiny little thing that um, is still going. It was launched in about, what, 1999 or something. Um, so Spitzer observed things at infrared wavelengths, and it was named after Lyman Spitzer. Oh, it's for infrared. And it was the old cutting edge infrared. And so you can see it's really tiny. And so while it was new, because no one had ever looked at the infrared from space before, it wasn't quite as transformational as Hubble. It just, you know, small mirror limits what you can do. So now Webb is going to do sort of what Spitzer did, only it's going to be gigantic. The other cool thing about Webb, so this is going to show you like where it actually is going to live. So this is the Earth, and this is Hubble, orbiting about 400 miles. This is the Moon, and then Webb is going to live way out on the other side of the Moon, about a million miles away. And the idea is, that this is a gravitationally stable point. It's called the Lagrange point. But you can put something out here that actually orbits with minimal drag. It doesn't have to deal with heat from the Earth or anything. This is infrared, so you want to have very cool temperatures. Um, and so the idea is that we're going to launch Webb, and it's going to go and orbit out here a million miles. So you can see that that's you know, very cool. But on the other hand, it's really hard to get to if you ever need to fix it. <laughs> What's interesting, what's interesting is that there is no mechanism that exists right now to fix it if there's a problem, so obviously it better work. But they can, were contractually obligated, this is NASA, um, by Congress, they were obligated to put a tow hook on, so like, like a truck hitch on it, just in case they never get out there and fix it. Uh, but anyhow, so, so this is, this is Webb. Um, this is what it's going to have to do after it launches and gets out to L2. This is a video showing you on it, how it unfolds. This is unfolding its solar panels because these are all solar powered things. And it's unfolding its mirror. And some of this is more sunshade. Look at what it has to do. Yeah, I mean, variables to get it right. Yeah. And when is this launching? Uh, that's a good question that I'll get into in a moment. <laughs> is this going towards the sun or away from the sun? Uh, what do you mean towards or away from the sun? The direction of. Uh, so this, this, right, so the mirror is going to be away from the sun. So the sun, this is a sun shield that's going to block the sun to keep it cool. Was there any analysis of the safety of that location from like asteroids or space um, debris? There, there are things that already exist in orbit around L2. Okay. So it's possible. It's possible. Um, anyhow, so it has to go through this, you know, this like kind of complicated origami thing to get itself unfurled. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed. When this moves. Now. Yes, there's a question over there. Is solar wind going to affect it? Is solar wind going to affect it? It will to some extent. Um, it has propellant in it um, that's going to be used to stabilize it. And so things like solar wind will create a torque that moves it around. It's also we orbit around a Lagrange point. And so it turns out that it's using propellant to stabilize. And this is one of the limiting things for its lifetime is how much propellant it has. We can't get more back out there. Yes. What is the uh, longevity of it estimated to be? The long, so the, the minimum requirement is supposed to be five years, and they think it could last 10. And then we tend to get more creative with the uses, so you could perhaps push it beyond that. Um, if we have a science-friendly Congress, it's possible we could actually do a robotic servicing mission there. Yeah. Um, is this James Webb thing? Mars than Earth? No, Mars is much, much farther. 
So it's closer. It's closer to the moon, but it's not closer to Mars. Well, yeah. Will, will it be in the shadow of the Earth at times or at, at all? Um, that's a good question. I think there are certain times at which it will fall into the shadow of the Earth, um, but that's not really designed as a primary observing mode. I mean, the sun shield <laughs> is really the important thing for blocking yeah. solar light. We have a lot of questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, does the James Webb have any redundancy built into it? Um, there are redundant electronics. Okay. Um, the propellant is much harder to build in redundancy for. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm asking this is because you had the Kepler yes. mission, yes. and the reason the Kepler mission failed was because of its gyros. Um, that's correct. So um, there are no gyros on Webb. It uses a different stabilizing mechanism that is you know, less susceptible to failure. So, um, so it's a part of the, the way you get new space telescopes built, like these big flagship missions, is you have to design new technology, and one of the new technology designs was non-gyro stability. I think there was one over the far side. Yeah. Yes. With the, uh, I would think there would be about like about a 10 to 15 second uh, time delay with the speed of light for the radio signals to be <coughs> Yes. On my couple, I would think that would be a, I guess, a solvable problem, but would be something that would have to be addressed. You mean for uploading and downloading data, or what? And more, more so controlling it real time. Yeah, so they upload, so so uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but they do all the long-range planning, so the telescope knows months in advance what it's going to be doing. So there's, there's no real-time control unless there's an emergency. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, are there uh, any provision for possible uh, servicing? Uh, as of right now, no. Uh, this is because there's no viable mechanism to get out there to fix it. We don't have a shuttle, you know, right. SpaceX. I was, thinking, I was thinking in 10 years, well, we should have the capability of uh, sending uh, men out there or mechanical, you know. So, yeah, in theory, I mean, we're hoping things like private companies like SpaceX can provide this, but NASA is not actively developing anything to do this. Um, this was a decision by Congress a few years ago not to pursue this through, through NASA. The, you know, ju just to talk a little bit about Webb, the reason you may have heard of this is not always positive. There is this article that came out uh, several years ago. This is this reoccurring theme that James Webb is eating astronomy. So the history of James Webb is like Hubble. It's long in its story. James Webb was a concept that started being developed in the late 80s. Um, it came to fruition around the year 2000 with the idea that it was supposed to launch in about 2011. And it has been plagued by all sorts of issues, much like Hubble, but different issues uh, since then. And so instead of launching in 2011, it keeps getting delayed and whatever. Uh, construction was finally completed in 2016, so they were five years behind schedule. And then uh, it was supposed to launch in 2018, but there were a series of, uh, let's call them like mismanagements and accidents. Um, Someone used the wrong solvent in one of the you know, cleaning things, and that dissolved some of the O-rings, and so that set them back. They finally fixed that. They got into the cryo chamber for testing, so they do these tests you know, that simulate the heck out of everything. And they said, okay, now we have to unfurl the sun shield, and it tore, so the sun shield ripped. And then they shook it, you know, because they have to do these flight tests, and then like 900 bolts fell off. They have to find all of them. And it's, it's just been one issue after another. And so the idea has been that is this eating the rest of astronomy's budget? Is it, you know, and, and fortunately, believe it or not, Congress is actually fairly science friendly and they keep extending the, the cost cap and they've been very supportive overall. The one thing that they required was more direct oversight. And so that happened starting last year. That led to a revised launch date, which is now March of 2021. Uh, but it actually seems to be on track for that, and there are people who are not involved in the engineering teams that are sitting over the engineer's shoulders watching this now, which is not the case in the past. So, launch date is now fixed for, or projected to be March 31st, 2021. Um, so, you know, this has been delays, but this is not any different than the problem. That remember that timeline. This is about the same. And as I said, these missions are complicated. They're expensive. A lot of moving parts and, and, and you know, mistakes happen. The key is, of course, if it doesn't, you know, you can't go fix it like Hubble. You can't go put corrective lenses or something on James Webb. There's just no way to get out there. So you have to make sure 
it works, otherwise we're really in trouble. And so it's better to be late and right than early and wrong with James Webb. Um, scientifically, it's going to do some amazing things. Um, and, and Linda alluded this, uh, to this in the beginning, um, that there are these so-called early release science programs. And these are the first science programs to be conducted with James Webb. So it's going to go up and launch in March of 2021. It's going to commission for about four or six months, which means they're going to figure out how it actually works in practice. And then they're going to immediately start doing science, because if it's only going to last five years, you better be ready to go right away. You don't have the ability to make it last longer. So this thing called Early Release Science, or ERS. This is the, the idea is to obtain images and spectroscopy that would be used to demonstrate the key mode of JWST instruments. The goal of this program is to enable the community to understand the performance of JWST prior to the submission of the first post-launch cycle two proposals that will be submitted just months after the end of commissioning. This is a long way of saying the following. James Webb will go up, and people are going to propose to use it having never seen data from it before. They just have to blindly say, this is what I want to do, and this is how we think it's going to work, because they need to start taking data right away, otherwise you run out of time in the mission. So these are supposed to be the first observations, the ERS, the first observations, and the teams will have to learn how to reduce the data and do science on them and then share that with the community in advance for the second round of proposals. And the idea is to provide training set and templates for people. And so this is something new. They never tried this before. Um, so it's exciting and also a little scary because we don't know how it's all going to work. Um, so you had to competitively propose to be an early release science team. So in May of 2017, they said, all right, give us your ideas for an early release science program. We're going to compete them against each other and pick the best ones, the most useful ones. So about 115 proposals came in from all over the place. And then November 13 were selected and announced. Um, there were 13 programs. They were given 500 hours of guaranteed time, which means as long as web works, they will happen. And these six broad science areas, solar system, planets, stellar populations, stellar physics, black holes, and galaxies. So basically spanning the whole spectrum of things that are interesting in astrophysics or that are contemporary. Um, this is where we have to brag about Berkeley a little bit. We got two of these ERS programs in our department at UC Berkeley. Uh, we are the only place to have two. The only place to have two. So a lot of this will be happening right across the country. So this is both exciting and terrifying because there's a lot of pressure to do this and get it right. Um, and so we're going to go look at a few local galaxies and popular clusters and build the software so that other people that's really what the early, early science program is about uh, that I'm leading. Um, and just to, to end on, on kind of the, the bigger picture, uh, right now what's happening is something called the Astronomy Decadal Survey. And so every 10 years since about 1950, every, the astronomy community gets together and takes a survey and puts together a report of what all the important things are that should happen in the next decade, what they should prioritize. Um, and it's this really interesting process because it's kind of this cross of science and politics and funding and all, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but what comes out is this really long report and, and, and it says these are the things that we should be doing. And then they go and they say, okay, now we need to go fund this. And then they go start lobbying Congress and Congress generally funds the first few highest priority things. In fact, this has been true for the last six, six decades. So, um, so this is going on like literally right now. My day started with the phone call with the chairs of, of this cable survey telling us about what was going on. And I just want to tell you about one concept that's being considered right now in the space regime. And that's something called the High Definition Space Telescope. And it would be a 12 to 16 meter multi-segmented space telescope that gets launched and orbits at L2. And if it were to be approved as part of the 2020 decadal, it would probably launch in 2040. I mean, it takes a long time to build these things. And we don't have anything that can carry a 12 or 16 meter space telescope even folded up right now. So I mean, there's a lot of technology development that has to happen here. However, the idea behind something like this is that it is big enough to actually find and identify Earth analog planets in a Milky Way. So that is the main science driver behind this, is that it can actually observe and characterize their atmospheres. 
and it can resolve galaxies to not quite the Andromeda scale that I showed you, but pretty darn close all the way up to the first galaxies in the distant universe. So those are the two main, two of the main science goals behind one of these. And so this is being competed against many other concepts right now. And so this is the whole process, and now we get together as a community and we get to make cases at each other as to why this mission should be prioritized over that mission. And I think this is one that has a lot of promise and can do some amazing science, especially in terms of planets. Yes? Does it observe in the visible or a variety of ways? So this observes all the way from the ultraviolet through the near infrared, so much like Hubble. Yeah, because it turns out to characterize Earth like planets, the best chance to do that is in the ultraviolet. Yeah. Yes? Is there a single uh, telescope out there that observes <coughs> every Um, is there any telescopes that do that? There is no telescope, and the reason is there's no telescope that observes in every wavelength because they all require some sort of different type of measurement technique. So what works really well in the optical does not work well with the radio and vice versa. So you have to have a bunch of different ones. Are there any telescopes that look, that look at stars in the X-ray and gamma? There are. There's something called Chandra, the Chandra telescope that looks in the X-rays. Pretty cool. Um, just to go back and circle back to Lyman Spitzer, because all of what I've talked about is really thanks to this paper he wrote in 1946 and really spent three decades of his life and his career advocating for. The things he said scientifically that are interesting, the extent of the universe, structure of galaxies, structure of globular clusters, and the nature of other planets, that is what we're doing now. We've learned so much, but there's so much more we can do by looking, for example, for other planets. Thank you so much. I want to ask you two questions. Sure. Different subjects. Yes. One is the, the big work you did on Andromeda. Yes. Um, it would seem that's a job for a big Schmidt telescope. Yeah. But no big Schmidt telescope has ever even been proposed to go up into space. So I'd like to ask you why 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 is it a, a, a big Schmidt telescope not the one to, to use for that? And the other question I want to ask you is this if the extent of the universe you, you kind of intimated that the Hubble was seeing out to more or less the end of the universe, or near the end. Yep. And I guess that's a, at a distance, the speed of light multiplied by the age of the universe, mm -hmm. or some two times that or something. Yeah, like. sure. Um, well, it, what's the opinion now? It, is it that the, the universe is finite like that, or, or is it that it goes on forever, or maybe it even has that saddle curve? Who knows? But what does your observation show? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try your first question because I don't know the answer exactly. I believe there was some consideration of Schmitt's very early on, like the 70s, for space telescopes. But for reasons that I don't know, it wasn't considered for, or it wasn't, didn't actually end up as a space telescope. I don't quite know why. Um, the center of the universe, we think, is the universe is flat. That means geometrically. So the way you define flat are you can make Euclidean triangles. Uh, and so the idea we think is that you can make triangles everywhere in the universe and that the angles add up in the Euclidean sense. Um, and that's what the observations bear out to the best of our ability. The thing is that we know this to about the second decimal place right now. But the interesting stuff seems to happen at one more decimal place. You know, that's what they always say, right? There's one more decimal place. But, uh, but this is, you know, it would be weird if it started deviating at several you know, decimal places instead of, of, of you know, just two or something like this. But, but to, to everything we know, the universe is, 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 a, is a flat and has a finite age. Does that mean that they will, as you get bigger telescopes, you will continuously always have new galaxies to see? Um, bigger, further away? Uh, the answer is no. At some point, um, so there's the Big Bang. The universe had to cool enough to actually get the galaxies. And so it took a few hundred million years of cooling to get to the first galaxies. So James Webb is our best hope of seeing those first galaxies. In fact, that's why it was built, is to find basically the, the very beginning of galaxy formation. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to know uh, when looking at uh, M31, uh, which is the nearest side of the disk toward us. Um, is it where you see more of the dust? you have a photo of that again? Um, I don't. Well, let's see. I do have the entire galaxy. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I suspect it's the one on the left side. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't remember if we picked. We didn't pick based on near side or far side. We picked on the one that has the most star formation activity which also probably is the dustiest. Now, I don't remember which, which way it's rotating uh, off the top of my head. Oh, no, I was talking about the Oh, you mean closer? You mean which side closer? closer? Uh, yeah, that's a good question that I also am not 100% sure of. Uh, we, we have mapped this because you can, you can actually measure this from the stars, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. So one of the results of the FAP survey is that M31 has about 25% fewer massive stars than the Milky Way. Yes, that's so, correct. Uh, as for my understanding, the more massive stars you have in the galaxy, the higher met the metallicity <coughs> of the galaxy, so the more likelihood you have of Earth-like planets. Yes. So does uh, your survey show anything about like what's the likelihood of planets, um, especially Earth-like planets? That's an interesting. I don't know that anyone's actually done the calculation. Now, here's the weird thing. Even though it has fewer massive stars, the metallicity is slightly higher than the Milky Way. Oh. So it's something we don't, you know, so something's going on that's not like totally kosher. And, and so one of the, I mean, one of the theories is that M31 has actually merged with other galaxies and that can bring in extra material and enrich it, but that's that's still a working hypothesis. But yeah, it's, it's very bizarre. Yeah. That's kind of both my questions right there. Uh, that picture of the dust. Yes. Kind of looked weird. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a uh, historical remnant of the uh, collision of uh, or eating of another galaxy? Mm -hmm. So the dust is yes, still it. visible, hasn't you know, gotten uniform yet. Yeah. The the issue we think um, so. So the question is, could this be the remnant of a past merger or something? That um, this is one of the hypotheses that people have suggested. The the problem with that is that all the dynamical theories suggest that this should have been mixed in more to the general population already, because it would have happened a few billion years ago to get all the other observational constraints, right? So it would have to be some additional component of the theory, which is totally possible. We just don't understand it though, a little detail yet. And, and, and my question about, again, about the 25% fewer yes. uh, stars, have you like ruled out the possibility that there's something in your observation that is giving you wrong information, or you're very confident that it's absolutely correct? Well, um, I think we're pretty confident. The reason is this, the massive stars are bright, and it's easy to find them. And if some, there would have to be some very bizarre effect that would not let us see them. And so it's not really obvious what that would be. There's another one, yes. I have three questions. Um, one is, how do they intend to communicate with the James Webb satellite? And yeah. Is that different to how they're communicating with Hubble? Uh, no, it's the same way. So we have something called the Deep Space Network, which mm -hmm. is a radio. It's basically a radio telescope in New Mexico, uh, coupled with a couple of like repeaters, basically, that, that do that communication. Since this is all funded by American Congress, so what is the accessibility of other countries and scientists from other universities to, the, to, this, to these uh, satellites? Um, so both the Hubble and um, James Webb have contributions, both financial and otherwise, from the European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency. So basically, for James Webb, uh, some other countries built particular instruments or did some particular development. And so in exchange, they get some percentage, like 5% of the time is guaranteed towards them. And Hubble had a similar arrangement, like 15% of the time went to Europe. I see. And then two clarifications. You said um, that Congress uh, demanded that there would be some some way to tow the, <laughs> yes, the that's satellites. Yes, right. What does that mean? Um, it means they physically had to put something on there. So if you ever had to grab it and move it, you would never grab a science instrument. <laughs> right? Because otherwise, you know, say you want to go out and actually have to physically, like, I put a tow truck in space or something and move it, uh -huh. what are you going to put the hook on? And so they had to put something that wasn't delicate to actually move it. <laughs> I see. Okay. I know, it's, I know, kind of silly. But and then just the last question, uh, just to clarify, you said that with the proposed satellite that might be launched in 2040, you said yeah. that the 
um, the resolution in which we would see the farthest away galaxies close to the resolution in which we see the closest gal galaxy? Um, I can make that a little more concrete for you. So, um, let's see. So, um, this image of M31 was taken with uh, smaller satellites than, than Hubble. 